is a brief study, Martin Coey. Thank you very much. So my study is very straightforward. The idea was simple in theory. The results completely surprising and it's taken everybody um, completely on the back foot. The study is called SurveyHF. It's been published in the New England Journal of Medicine this morning. If you want more details, all of the slides available at late breaking clinical trial session. Lots of excitement about this. Idea is very straightforward. If you have heart failure and you have sleep apnea, and the form you get in heart failure is often called chain stokes, where your respiration is very slow and stops and then speeds up again. Where the idea is that those patients do particularly badly. Why don't you use mask therapy with a more sophisticated form of CPAP called ASV, which actually gets rid of the chain stokes, get rid of that abnormal physiology, you should improve the outcome for patients. Lots of small studies with surrogate endpoints showing that that should make a difference. So we did serve HF, the world's largest randomized trial in sleep apnea, 91 centers in 11 countries. I'll show you the primary endpoint results and some of the secondary endpoints in a second with the key slides. These are the type of patients, adult patients with obvious systolic heart failure on good medical therapy, NYHA 3 or 4 or class 2 with a previous hospitalization, and good going central sleep apnea. So a good group to test the hypothesis. Let's get rid of the central sleep apnea and see what happens to our patients. This slide only to show the point, these are very well treated patients. You see the use of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers well above 90%, and more than 50% had an implanted device, ICD or CRT. So nobody can argue we poorly treated the patients. We controlled the central sleep apnea beautifully. So the AHI went down from 31 to only six um, during the therapy, and the oxygen desaturation index also dramatically improved. So nobody can argue we didn't control the central sleep apnea. Now let me show you the results. Results were neutral. We made no difference overall in the primary endpoint. So getting rid of the grossly abnormal physiology made no difference in the primary outcome, which was time to all-cause death, hospitalization for worsening heart failure, and life-saving cardiovascular interventions such as transplant, LVAD implantation, or ICD shock that was appropriate. So no difference there. However, the big surprise that shocked the respiratory and cardiovascular communities, next two slides, my final two slides. All-cause death, 28% increase in mortality. You can see that throughout the trial. Best estimate, 28%. Unlikely to be due to chance, there's a confidence interval. Somewhere between 6 and 55% increase in mortality by controlling the chain stokes respiration. If you look at cardiovascular death, the evidence is even stronger. 34% increase in controlling the central sleep apnea. So this study is a game changer. We don't understand central sleep apnea. Maybe it's compensatory, as has been suggested almost in jest a few years ago um, by Norton. Or maybe it's positive airway pressure, but not very much evidence that that is a toxic therapy. This is a game changer. Overall neutral, but an increase in mortality. Thank you very much. Excellent. You kept within the standard deviation. Well done, Martin. And it's a brave study. It's, as Martin said, potentially a paradigm shifter. Would like questions because this is something that needs discussion. So the press, please. Nobody's got questions? Well, the Nike, yeah. oh yes, please go ahead. Well, in our New England paper this morning, we've got two main theories. And of course, you can understand we're spending a lot of time trying to tease this out now. This took us completely by surprise. But it does seem in subgroup analysis, the more chain stokes you had, the worse you did by correcting it. So I think there is something about chain stokes we don't understand. There's at least four different reasons why chain stoke might actually help a heart failure patient. Resting respiratory muscles, for example, protecting from alkalosis, um, also um, allowing intrinsic PEEP in terms of keeping the lung volume up and increasing oxygenation. So perhaps it's compensatory and getting rid of it is not such a good idea. That's one theory. The other one that by applying positive air pressure to a, a poor ventricle may be harmful. But all of the other literature suggests if wedge pressure is high, for example, that positive airway pressure is helpful. But those are the two main theories. 
The final one, which I heard last night, which is an interesting one, is maybe it is getting rid of chain stokes only periodically, so just during the night, and then allowing a rebound during the day might actually be important. All of it's speculation. Everybody's now going back to the literature, trying to see what the physiology is. And this really is a game changer. I really think the textbooks will be changed as a result of this study. Um, Martin, uh, how many events were then the deaths? Deaths were um, about oh, 120 deaths. Um, uh, there is a reason I ask. I mean, clearly it's an impressive result, but I would expect there are other trials of similar questions going on. Um, 120 isn't tiny, but it isn't like an ISIS trial yep. or, or major yep. trial that is so clear that you would now say, you know, we have the definitive answer. Obviously, it's a very worrisome answer. So the question I have to you is, given the moderate number of events, it isn't tiny, uh, and given the fact that it's an unexpected and early result, and given the fact it's a secondary endpoint, yep. Uh, would you, and given the fact that this is a strategy trial, there are different ways to, I suppose, uh, do po you know the ventilation thing. Do you think there is room for other trials that are ongoing to uh, keep on going unless their own data monitoring committee says, look, there's a problem, please stop? Because we really want to definitively answer the question, don't we? Sure. So tell me what your thoughts on that are. We don't want to stop other studies, do we? I've got mixed feelings about it, to be honest. Okay. The companies producing the technology have issued a global safety notice. So actually, physicians now choosing to use the technology have the companies not supporting them for systolic heart failure. So I think sure. physicians need to know that. That's a big change in the kind of legal status of sure. this type of therapy. CANPAP was a study of CPAP and heart failure, much smaller, which was almost stopped for harm initially. Really? And then for futility because they weren't recruiting fast enough. So not good evidence there. There's the ADVENT study, which includes a wide spectrum of sleep disordered breathing and systolic heart failure, but mostly obstructive, but some central. But I haven't shown you a slide that we've actually seen. We're looking at the sudden death in these patients. There's no difference in progressive heart failure mortality, progressive heart failure hospitalization. If you look at patients who die without preceding hospitalization, so presumably sudden, the hazard ratio is 2.5, and the curves separate almost immediately, and it's during the day and the night. So I think we have to take this seriously. Um, I think Advent is still going on, but they haven't seen our full data set. Let's see what those investigators feel on DSMB feel. Sure. We do have the data. We haven't uh, finished assaying all the samples, so we're now going to be looking at that. But I would be surprised if there's a change in BNP, because there's no change in symptoms of the patients, there's no change in progressive heart failure death, there's no change in progressive heart failure hospitalizations at all. It's all a kind of sudden death story. I think it's about arrhythmia. Uh, you were protected in the study by a certain extent by having an ICD but the toxic effect is still seen. So that's the angle that we're most suspicious that there's some issue. Do we reset the autonomic system? Do we change the heart's propensity to arrhythmia? What does chain stokes do to arrhythmic potential in the sympathetic <coughs> nervous system? Lots of questions. I'm sorry I've only got questions to respond rather than answers. Yeah. There's Hi, a Crystal Fenn with MedPage today. Um, so you said that this can't be generalized to um, preserved Hi, heart um, preserved ejection fraction patients. Yeah. Um, and so, what's what's special about these patients that would lead to sudden death when they're getting this? And um, why would you think that it wouldn't generalize to other central sleep apnea patients? I think the issue is this is very good going systolic heart failure, very low ejection fraction, very symptomatic, and a lot of treatment. These are six systolic heart failure patients, and the physiology there is very different from the physiology you find in heart failure preserved ejection fraction. And as um, Professor Yusuf says, this is a study, it's an unexpected finding, it's a secondary endpoint. I don't want to close a door by saying I can extrapolate from my study, I want to just stick to this study population where we've got robust results, and I would think more research is needed in all of those areas. So you're saying more research is needed in the preserved ejection fraction, but exactly. also non-heart failure patients? 
Well, chain I'm stokes sure. is very, very rarely seen in anybody other than okay. heart failure patients. So it really is, is restricted to that. I also think that obstructive sleep apnea is a totally different syndrome from central sleep apnea, and just calling them the same sleep apnea may be a big mistake. What's happening in the chest and the hemodynamics is totally different. So I think it's really important to say this is for heart failure, systolic heart failure, but a real game changer. So some physicians are going to have to change their practice because they went ahead of the clinical evidence base. Here we've got good results, robust results, I feel, but don't extrapolate from the study population. Uh, my colleague has a question. Yeah, Martin, the number of respiratory infections were different between the two groups? I can't answer that question, I'm afraid. I'd have to go back to our Medra data set and have a look at it. But we have run through all the analyses and there was no other signals, really, but I haven't got the specific but answer. Was, uh, was referred that in, in such patients, the number of respiratory infections could be increased it's and this could, could explain the same, same effects, yeah. Yes, but the mode of death was more sudden than hospitalization type death, so possibly, and we'll certainly go back. I'm very grateful to get any thoughts as to how we can explain this, but we're drilling down and I think it's going to be more a sudden death, arrhythmia, uh, autonomic nervous system type effect. Please, would you stand up? Then we can see you, actually, to be honest with you. Yes, except that I want to type, so uh, I politely declined. Um, this is Lynn Peterson from Trends in Medicine. So let me just understand, how often is, um, is this being used currently uh, for central sleep apnea in heart failure patients? And so doctors should stop doing this? And so, I mean, is it a common thing, or is this still a rare thing that would have been expanded if this had been a, a positive trial? Certainly, if it had been positive, this would have been a game changer in terms of cardiologists having to learn about sleep apnea and hundreds of thousands of patients potentially being treated. Um, at the moment, it varied from country to country. In the UK, it was only ever done as part of a clinical trial, but in Germany and France, there are quite a few patients on ESV therapy and systolic heart failure. In the States, for example, the technology is licensed for the treatment of the sleep apnea. So physicians were using it if they chose to look for the sleep apnea, and that now is not supported by the companies who no, uh, no longer advise using ASV and systolic heart failure. Well, you know, I, this is really a brave and important study, and thank you for presenting it yeah. so uh, in a very straightforward manner.